Welcome to the I am Ahmedabad NSC Behavioral Science uh, webinar series. Today we will be talking to two one of, of my colleague and uh, friends, uh, and we will be talking about leapfrogging to your future. The NSC IMA uh, Behavioral Science uh, Center was started in collaboration with NSC, and uh, we focus on behavioral science with a special focus on neuroscience in mainly the areas of finance, economics, marketing, OB and HR. As a part of the center, we do a lot of research revolving around neuroscience and the applications of neuroscience to management. We also look at how behavioral science can be used to impact a number of other management and public policy uh, disciplines. As a part of our outreach and a part of our knowledge dissemination, we conduct webinars and regular intervals. Today, I am joined by uh, the authors of Leapfrogging, a uh, Leapfrog Six Practices to Thrive, Dr. Mukesh Sood, uh, who and uh, Dr. Priyank Narayan. Uh, Mukesh is a colleague of mine and an associate professor in the strategy area. Uh, he is an engineer from IIT Delhi. Before that, he has spent three decades between academy and entrepreneurship. And he's also a visiting faculty at Ashoka University. Uh, Mukesh does a lot of, conducts a lot of executive education programs in design thinking and creating entrepreneurial organizations. And as a side note, Mukesh and I are also from the same um, alma mater for our PhD. Uh, Dr. Narayan, Priyank Narayan uh, teaches multiple courses in design thinking, innovation management, and uh, developing an entrepreneurial mindset at Ashoka. Uh, he holds a PhD from IIT Delhi, and he's also a guest faculty at IIT Delhi, I'm Ahmedabad, and at GC Paris. So, uh, without further ado, let me jump right into this webinar and our discussion with my uh, good friend Mukesh and Priyank. Uh, so Mukesh, let me ask you this first question. Uh, why did you decide to write a book called Leapfrog and how did it come about? Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Aditya. Uh, firstly, thank you very, very much for facilitating this. And I know the amount of work that all of you put in and Varuna behind the scenes and you in front. So thanks a lot. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here and talking to your audience. Um, you know, um, as you know, Aditya, as academics, we are all focused on research. So we write papers, we get them published in journals, and we do primary and secondary research. But the problem with that uh, is that the number of people who potentially read what we write is very limited. Uh, basically, uh, researchers like us and some of our students. So we discovered and me and Priyank were jointly teaching courses and interacting with students and they asked us look all this research in the social sciences that you seem to be so aware of why aren't you trying to put it to a larger audience so the whole concept started with how can we reach our students our alums and a wider group of people as far as the word leapfrog is concerned all credit to Priyank he thought of the name and then he withdrew it, <laughs> but I clung on to it and we finally got our publishers to accept it. So Priyank, uh, maybe you can add to that. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Aditya, for having us here. So, um, you know, with Mukesh and I have teaching for so many years, we have a number of students, alums who come back and share stories of what's worked for them, what's not worked. A lot of recruiters actually come back and share, um, you know, various things that they love about what the students bring to the table. And we said, in, in, in a lot of ways, our classrooms are very privileged, right? Whether it's an I am Ahmedabad classroom or uh, for that matter, even Ashoka, it's very selective. How do we actually bring some of these conversations that we have in our classrooms to a larger audience um, so that a larger number of people can actually use these to leapfrog in their career? And, and that's the premise of the book. That's why we thought of it. That's why we conceptualized it. And we actually made it into little nuggets, very chewable uh, six practices. Uh, each practice is supported by three pillars, 
which means to to build and develop that practice you can you know work on those three pillars and that will help uh, you know take your career forward or your even i mean it's it's not just for career it's for everybody so if you want to do well um, as as a person leapfrog in life um it's it's a book that will be relevant for you thank you priyank and thank you mukesh so let me jump right in so there are a lot of behavioral science uh, research that you have used uh, the first one that is very close to my heart is grit and you have spoken about grit in i think the first chapter in your book um so uh, one can you tell our audience about how grit can help a person uh, reach or thrive and meet their potential and two can you help people understand that drip grit how can they develop grit on their own so i i'll, I'll take a step back and say that um, grit which has been popularized by angela duckworth and now of course a lot of behavioral scientists talk about it is basically passion and perseverance the two p's towards a goal and it all started when she was trying to evaluate why some uh, students in the us um, um, armed forces quit a program and some of them last through the program and she found that all the conventional tests that she was doing didn't really portend the likelihood that somebody would persevere that's when the idea of grit came in and then grit has now become a standard tool to evaluate how successful you are likely to be when you have a clarity about your ultimate goal priyank you want to add to that so um aditya it's an interesting question that you ask um i think fundamentally what we want to say is that there's no shortcut to hard work you can learn you can read you can do and and it's not just our book many books are out there who will give different mantras but it all starts with putting in the hours and and what pukesh was talking about which is passion and perseverance i just add one word to it is it's that it has to sustain over a period of time so that timing is the, the how long you're able to sustain that is very very important and it's more relevant in today's time because we have so many distractions i mean every every gratification is instant um every means of entertainment and engagement is is short lived so to say right it's 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 uh, the era and generation of short reels and short en- engagement models there are a couple of ideas that we've actually talked about in terms of developing grit uh, and and the first one is to practice but practice with a purpose right purposeful practice or deliberate practice right and how is it different from regular practice regular practice is about how many times you're repeating what you you need to do to to build your craft or build your art um when we talk about deliberate practice we're really talking about that 1% improvement with every repetition right getting a coach on board trying to measure whether that moment of practice is working for you or not and how you're able to measure your success against that so that's a very important element of grit that actually um, comes about but there's one very important element in addition to that which is which and which is what a lot of sports people are also say you know what makes uh, a sports person elite versus an average sports person it is their ability to sustain the boredom of practice At the end of the day you may love sports but the fact is that to get to a national international level you are practicing the same thing again and again and again how do you sustain that boredom and there are some very fun ways in which you can deal with boredom first of all of course acknowledge the fact that boredom is an important part of of grit so you have to address it deal with it but at the same time it's also important that you make your task fun you make your task light so we've talked about some of those elements um in in order to develop grit so i did i'll just jump in here the book is not a scholarly book in fact we have avoided using any management jargon whatsoever it is basically a bunch of stories of examples and real life examples many of them rooted in india for example on grit uh, we've looked at the spelling bee champs and uh, do you know 18 of the 19 or 19 of the last 20 champs happen to be of indian origin with very nice south indian names now what made them so good at what they do and what priyank was mentioning about boredom for example they invented a way of making practice fun so one of the participants got her grandmother to repeat the word and the grandmother being of indian origin and being living in india didn't have the right pronunciation 
So they would connect it to a speaker and then they would erupt in laughter when the grandmom spelt it differently or pronounced it differently. So it is this ability to withstand boredom and extract fun in anything you do that is one way of developing grit. Okay. Uh, so one question that I had was, uh, yes, grit, grit by itself is obviously related to a lot of things that you just said. Uh, but also we find that gratification and more, more so instant gratification has become almost like a norm in society. Uh, do you think having been conscious about uh, delayed gratification will actually help people achieve their full potential? Yeah, so we have in a different chapter, in a different context, talked about the, the pleasure of small wins, where we break a big target up into smaller parts and you delay your ultimate gratification, but you get pleasure every time you achieve a small sub goal. And that carries you on because not, not many of us have the ability to delay our gratif gratification indefinitely. But if we do it in smaller installments, uh, Priyank, you want to carry that forward? You are a big fan of atomic habits. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think I think you've put it really well, right? It's it's really how do you celebrate, you know, in, in a in a different way. Look at look at the progress bar that you have on a on a task, on a video game, on anything that we see today. What is it? It's just so just telling you that you are that much close to the end or that much far from the end. And that is a way of saying how far is your gratification. Right. So I think there are various ways in which you can tease yourself, nudge yourself, push yourself into believing that you are being gratified with every small win. And that uh, is something which, uh, I mean, even from a behavioral science perspective, uh, is a very relevant uh, fact in theory. So, uh, yeah. yeah that's, Again, that's just to add an, uh, add an anecdote to that, it all started when um, a professor put a bar on, on the on the game or the assignment and said, this much has been completed. Then he said that, look, the bar is not accurate. So it, the numbers are all over. And he gave the option of having the bar or not having the bar, the progress bar. And uh, everybody said, we need the bar because it lets us know that we are so close to the ultimate goal, even if the, it is not an accurate portent. Absolutely. All right. Uh, that brings me to one of my uh, our area colleagues, a lot of my area colleagues, they work in the area of nudging. And so you have spoken about nudge. So why don't you, why don't we explore that area a little more? Uh, one, can you, for the benefit of the audience, how do people use nudges? How do they benefit? What are they actually doing? If you could uh, shed some light on this topic. Yeah, so Priyank has a few personal examples. So I'm going to pass it on to him to give you those small anecdotes from, from his personal experience. All right. Okay, so there are various elements to, to nudging, right? What is it that it comes from, of course, uh, the, the theory of behavioral economics, uh, Richard Taylor popularized it, but it's, and it got popularized, you know, a few years back when he got the, the Nobel Prize for it. But it's been there forever. It's been it's it's not something that uh, you know is is a new thing that uh, has come into this world. A nudge essentially means that you are giving or pushing people to behave in a certain way without restricting their choices, or giving them a monetary incentive. And third factor, of course, is that you're keeping the human or the the person at at the the user, the customer at the core of it. Right. So, so you're increasing choices, you're pushing them to take a certain, uh, to behave in a certain way, but you're not really giving a monetary incentive. And what we have, we've given it a little spin. We're saying, can there be nudges that work on yourself? Right. Can you, can you nudge yourself instead of somebody else nudging you in, in a particular direction or for a particular task? So there are various elements Two, two nudging. One is, of course, uh, choice architecture. So in, in the way choices are presented to us, uh, we choose uh, a, a certain, we make our, make our choices. So for example, default options uh, is a classic example of a nudge. 
uh, every time you're booking an airline ticket, um, when you come to the checkout, you already have uh, the insurance for 50 rupees or 100 rupees already checked. Um, and uh, you have to uncheck it if you don't want to pay that 100 rupees for insurance. Uh, that's an example of a nudge, right? The, the airline is pushing you, nudging you to, to buy, buy insurance. And, and this is something the world over people have measured that default options push you uh, to behave in a, in a certain way. There is another element of how choices or how, um, how, you, how we choose uh, uh, from how data is presented to us, right? So for example, um, in, in a supermarket, uh, items that are kept at an eye level are the items that actually get picked up much more than what is there at uh, above or below uh, eye level. Um, so there are various ways that nudges actually are working on us every day. Um, marketers are using this uh, in different ways. Governments are using it in different ways. So, for example, Swachh Bharat, and we all, you know, all celebrated uh, Gandhi Jayanti just a few days back. Um, that whole symbol of Gandhiji's spectacles has become a nudge and a reminder of cleanliness. Um, a similar campaign was also done in Texas, uh, which was called Don't Mess with Texas. It was about cleaning up and getting Texas, um, uh, you know, cleaning, actually getting the roads in Texas to be cleaned up. That was another campaign which became, you know, um, a statewide campaign to get people to, to behave in a certain way. So there is there are, you know, various ideas around nudges. Uh, Mukesh, would you want to share a few um, stories on nudges or... I, I think I'll let, let the story stay in the book. We've given them a broad idea, but there are a number of ones that we use. And uh, right from, you know, um, collecting waste and filling it up in a dustbin to keep your streets clean uh, to, of course, the Swachh Bharat that uh, Priyank talked about. But there are a number of small examples how your homework is given to you by professors and in terms of the deadlines that you have. So you can nudge yourself knowing that you don't want everything to pile up at the end of the term, you set small goals and say, I'm committing to do it on a particular day. So the book is a number of such examples. Uh, thank you, Mukesh. Thank you, Priyank. One very interesting thing that you have written in your book is about becoming T-shaped. Uh, now, this is a real, well, it's kind of, let me put it this way. A lot of I am similar to ours. We believe in general management. So we believe that you need to be broad based, right? Uh, there is a lot of pressure from especially engineering colleges, uh, which are pushing people to become more, more and more specialized. And uh, more and more specialized means more and more uh, niche in their, this thing. But you are suggesting that people should become T-shaped. Now, that is a mixture of both a generalist and a specialist. Uh, can you give me a little bit more about this? Yeah, I think, Aditya, you put it very well. You are both a generalist and a specialist. So the long arm of the T uh, is your area of specialization. It's a field you know very well. You are an expert in that field. But you have broad domain knowledge of other fields so that you're willing to share your ideas. You're willing to exchange your ideas, share your ideas, accept other people's ideas. And uh, the, the phrase that we have used in the book, which is from a company called IDEO, IDEO, uh, is strong ideas loosely held. So I have domain knowledge. I have got strong ideas, but I'm willing to trade them and share them. Priyank. So... Um... Aditya, it, we are also, while we are talking about super specialization and, you know, having a core, et cetera, it's also the age for interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, education, right? We are, one of the biggest challenges that we all face as educators is that we are preparing our students for careers that are going to be in the next 50, uh, you know, valid for the next 50 years and jobs that don't yet exist. And that's a reality, right? Uh, you know, what you're teaching today has to be applied, has to be applied into a, into a job that you and I have not really even imagined today. So just one discipline often gets you into a silo. What we are trying to refer to as a T-shaped profile, and you know, you've seen what a T looks like. 
you go deep into one discipline for which you are known for. And that's where, you know, what you're talking about saying, get specialization, build the expertise there. And then you have the horizontal part of the T, which lies on top, which gives you the ability to collaborate across disciplines. Now, this horizontal part of the T is where you actually have the humility to learn from various other disciplines. You also actually study multiple things so that you start seeing it not just as one discipline, but uh, trying to see a multidisciplinary approach. What this has done is actually very interesting, right? It, it, is, it is allowing disciplines to study new concepts. So I'll give you an example. What is common between a person who studies literature and a, and a computer scientist? Can they come together and work? It's given birth to a new discipline called digital humanities. They are now studying Shakespeare Imagine all of the volumes of Shakespeare using machine learning. So they throw in all the, all the literary work into a computer and let the computer look at patterns and you know, ask questions on, how, on what a human eye cannot see as, as literature, what he's done, what he's done with words, what he's done with expressions and so on. And so there are various questions now being developed around the area of digital humanities, right? This is just one example. Another very interesting example, what do biologists and historians have in common? You know what they're doing? They're working together and now working on carbon dating, looking at archeological uh, excavations that come out from sites and how biologists can date them using the same technology that they use to date trees, et cetera. So now they are, they are completely, uh, and it's called evolutionary, bio, uh, evolutionary archeology. span uh, so they are they are really bringing in different disciplines together. So there are there are various opportunities that will emerge from understanding two disciplines. In fact, one of our colleagues calls it contradisciplinarity, right? So it's not just create a T shape where you coming together to look at two complementary uh, disciplines. Can you be bold enough to look at two completely unrelated disciplines? bring them together and see what best you can bring from each of the disciplines and then add value to literature, to research, to also an application of it, to practice of it and so on. So, so the world is going to move towards the T-shaped profile. I also want to give one sort of word of caution here with T-shaped profiles, right? Especially when we are encouraging our students to study many disciplines, uh, you know, be as interdisciplinary. Being interdisciplinary doesn't mean you should be a jack of all trades. Being interdisciplinary and a T-shape means that you are known for one discipline. You do build your reputation, your expertise, your skill, your craft in that one discipline, but you work across multiple disciplines and you collaborate. So, so coming back to your point, which you said, you know, the, the engineers especially are focused on, you know, focused on one particular thing. And please do focus on that one particular thing, as long as your ability to work across the board with the specialization that you've built, you are a T-shaped profile. And that is something which will help you leapfrog. That, will, that is something that will help you be relevant for a much longer time than a unidisciplinary or a single disciplinary profile. Again, I can't help but jump in with a small anecdote because I think anecdotes carry substance, not uh, lectures. Um, we've used the example of Manjul Bhargava. Now, Manjul is of Indian origin. I, I think he's more Indian than many of us. And growing up, he grew up in a mathematical household where his mother was a, a maths professor. And he was a troublesome kid. So his mother used to ship him off to Jaipur to be with his grandfather, who was a Sanskrit scholar, and, uh, and loved Indian music. So he grew up connecting music and Sanskrit with math. And he did his PhD at Harvard where he had more courses in other disciplines than in math. And he says that to think of solving serious problems that the mathematicians have today, you need to think of them in a completely different way. And as you probably know, he is the youngest winner of the Fields Medal, the equivalent to the Nobel Prize. As the, and is the youngest um, tenured professor at Princeton. Uh, he offers an undergrad course in math. He calls it magic. 
And their reading material is a pack of playing cards. And all they do the, throughout the term is see the, 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 music, the, the math and magic, the connection between the two. Thank you. That was a brilliant anecdote. Uh, now, this is, this is my question to both of you, right? I know both of you work in entrepreneurship. You have, uh, you have done a lot of work around innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and to a lot of people, entrepreneurship means chaos or <laughs> the beginning of chaos, right? And you talk about chaos also in your book. Uh, before you answer how to use it, I want to know how did your work, how did your love for entrepreneurship impact this book? Okay, so all difficult questions, Aditya, are for Priyank. So Priyank, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Aditya, this book has been like a little venture for us, right? It's been a startup for us. It's it's something that you know we've applied every um, trick um, that we teach uh, in 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 entrepreneurship to our uh, to our book. So, uh, in fact, uh, when we launched the book um, a few months back, one of our students who was there in the audience said that you know tell us how did. Uh, what principles of entrepreneurship uh, are really being applied um, to this to this startup of yours, which is Leapfrog? And and our answer was why we wrote the book, which is you know we're trying to solve a problem, and that problem is that research is not accessible to the common reader. So we start with that, right? We we start with identifying a problem that we passionately feel about, and then how do we solve a, solve it? And once we've created the book, and we of course you know all all of strategy all of planning all of execution all of operations i think there is an element of that which sort of goes into bringing together a project like this but i think the more exciting part of it is creating the outreach right the once you've got something which is a product which uh, the world has accepted by the way we became a national bestseller within 3 months um, which which gave us a lot of validation for what we had created. Um, it's been a very very gratifying journey to see a lot of people benefit from it. A lot of people see the value that comes out of it, um, Aditya. So it's it's been a full startup. It's a full entrepreneurial journey, and it's been very yes. It had its own sense of chaos um, in, in it. Uh, one of the elements that we've talked about in the book is actually also to think uh, entrepreneurially and be entrepreneurs in everything that we do. And so as teachers, uh, and, and not many people here will believe, but being a teacher, being a faculty is one of the most entrepreneurial things that, that we can do. Um, the element of entrepreneurship is uh, that we want to bring out is the audacity to ask. Entrepreneur is always asking, asking for help, because it takes a lot to actually bring out um, the you know your for you to ask for help and with that we were able to actually bring in a lot of value from our networks i'll share a story on this and if you allow me i'm also going to share my screen because i have a little visual to uh to show the audience and i think they'll like it uh give me a second can you guys see my screen now Okay, so so here is this the story of uh, when when Prime Minister Modi had gone to Texas for the Howdy Modi event, you know, the big event where he was uh, addressing a, a big audience in a stadium in 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 Texas in in Houston. Um, there were these boys and girls lined up uh, to welcome him, and they were. Uh, you know, waiting and waving at him as as the prime minister and and Trump, President Trump, then the, the walked past them, and this boy actually was audacious enough to step forward and ask um, President Trump for a selfie. Uh, Modi, who had walked a few steps ahead, actually walked back and joined the huddle, and what he clicked was arguably one of the most powerful selfies in the world. It was the audacity to ask. Um, and it's very simple, uh, Aditya. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Um, so 
by asking you are improving your chances by at least 50 percent um so my my message to everybody out there is that ask ask for help be an entrepreneur and and that's what we did when we went through this whole journey of putting together uh, leapfrog mukesh yeah. we've also used the example of uh, steve jobs where he picks up uh, he opens the telephone directory and he calls bill hewitt and says i'm trying to make um, a component and do you have space for it and Bill Hewitt was still listed in the telephone directory. So he laughed and he laughed and he laughed saying this 13 year old kid has had, had the audacity to ask me for parts. Well, he got all the parts and he also got a summer job training at HP. So unless you ask, the answer is no, as Priyank mentioned. So one aspect of entrepreneurship is that they don't mind asking and they ask in their networks. They ask for strangers, they ask people they casually meet. And you heard the classical three Fs of, of, of uh, support, friends, family, and fools. So they're always asking. Sorry, we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, thanks, Mukesh. All right, so before I hand it over for the questions, I wanted uh, your final thoughts or um, one, a little bit more about the book and also your final thoughts for people who uh, want to leapfrog in their careers. Okay, so I'll take the first part. Uh, people who want to leapfrog, my, one of my uh, pet chapters here is intellectual humility. Uh, the ability to recognize that we don't know everything and that we need to be able to accept that and get people into our network, get help from people who know more than us. And we've given another number of examples of that. So if you want to leapfrog in your, in your career, in your life, you need to be humble. You need to be proud of what you know, but be willing to listen if there's a change in facts or some new information emerges. And uh, Priyank, you might like to talk about the, the, the personal journey map also that we have come out with in the book. Sure, sure, sure. So um, Aditya, after we talked about the six practices um, that that can actually help uh, people leapfrog. We've also given them a tool, right? The tool is, uh, and you know, you may be familiar with the business model canvas, which has uh, nine boxes to craft um, a one-pager strategy of your startup. Now, what about the startup of you as, as an individual? As an individual, your career, your life, your variables, these are, I mean, if you look at your life and your career, it's, it is really like a startup. So we've provided a toolkit, which is called the personal journey map. It has a very simple six boxes. It talks about what your goals are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, um, where are the opportunities that you can uh, benefit from, um, where are the, what are the sacrifices that you're willing to make for uh, reaching your goal. And finally, when you list down your roadmap, what is the basic first step that you need to work towards execution? So the book is actually, we, we, we use it with our students all the time. And the book has a lot of samples of various students who've used it and have actually benefited from uh, using the personal journey map. Um, there is one more element, um, Aditya, which I really want to share with, with the, uh, all the RR listeners today which is that we are living in a world of plenty, right? We are living in a world of chaos uh, that you talked about in your previous question as well. So one of the most important skills that will differentiate you out there and help you leapfrog is your ability to curate. How are you able to present the multitude of data, information, in fact, very often wrong information available to you? Uh, to your organization, to your bosses, to your teams, to, to everybody. And that is not an easy task. People love curated data. In fact, today, if you look at business models, which are the models that are working well, wherever there is a curation of information, for example, Daily Hunt, it's one of the leading uh, apps for uh, accessing news. What is it doing? It's picking up news from every source and giving you a stream which is curated for you, right? I'll give one very interesting anecdote. And again, I'm going to share my screen if, if that works. 
This is a story from uh, an experiment that was done in the US at a supermarket. There were two tables set up outside a supermarket, right? One had six flavors of jams and the other one had 24 flavors of jams. Now we all love choices, right? So um, you would love 24 flavors. But as the experiment progressed, people who actually bought, 30% of the people who visited the table with six flavors bought the jam. And only 3% who, who visited the table with 24 flavors bought the jam. What does this tell you? That very often, more is not the most desirable answer, right? If you're able to bring that choice down so that people can make decisions, help people make those decisions, that is going to be an important part of your growth, your progress, and how you're able to present choices. Remember, this is going back to the ideas of nudges, of behavioral science, behavioral economics, that we need to present our choices well, the choice architecture, how choices are going to be available to our audience. So that's that's something that I want to leave um, everyone with. Uh, thank you so much. Before before we uh, before we re go into uh, the Q and A, leapfrog, the word leapfrog, right? So uh, why leapfrog is my question. <laughs> why did you come up with this title for the book? I know. Uh, <laughs> Mukesh said that it was all Priyank, but we want to know the... Okay, so once Priyank came out with this catchy title, I then started researching it. And leapfrogging is actually uh, a topic in organizational studies where an existing player who is stagnant, uh, a new player jumps over them, either because of advantages in initial costs or technology has changed, or something in the environment has, like, you know, for example, we have leapfrogged from the handheld te telephone into, into the mobile sphere. We have leapfrogged into 5G. So because we didn't have baggage attached with us, we could take those decisions. So leapfrogging is actually a very common concept where a new player takes advantages of the change in the environment, the change in technology, the change in costing, to jump one or two generations. So that's how we thought of the word leapfrog. Yeah. I, I think Aditya, the, the basic principle is you can't just now be happy with the linear growth of your career, of your lives, and so on. The world is moving generations, right? It's a classic statement that you know sometimes things don't happen for decades, and then decades happen in, in, in weeks or days. And we are experiencing those change. I mean, look at what the generative AI world is going to give us and what it's already giving us. It, it is going to move technology. Uh, revolution is going to happen. The next revolution, we are at the cusp of it. So it, it is, it's going to be larger, if not as big as what we experienced when the internet was introduced to us in our lives. Right. So we need to leapfrog. We need to be ready for that leapfrog. If you you're going to stagnate if you're going to. It's it's a little bit like when you say in mutual funds, if you're if you're making only six seven percent, you're not making any money because that's the, the rate of inflation in any case, right? So you you need to move much faster than 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 the rate of change of the world outside, and that's leapfrog. Thank you so much, Mukesh. Thank you so much, Priyank. Um, and uh, if if you have not read the book. Uh, please go ahead and uh, get a copy of it. It's one of the best sellers in India currently. Uh, and uh, they talk about a lot of behavioral research and anecdotes and how to actually uh, use this behavioral science that we talk about, whether it's grit, whether it's nudging uh, in real life. So now we'll move over to the questions. Um, well, the first question is from Lalita. And I think, uh, she wants to know grit and how is it connected to leapfrogging? <clears throat> Priyank, I'll take the second question from Nilesh. So you go ahead. I think she means grit. Grit, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So grit is what we talked about in the initial part of our conversation um, about working hard, about having your passion and perseverance and sustaining that over a period of time. 
Um, so while you may have multiple interests that uh, you, you cultivate, you're able to build your interests in one particular area and become a master at it over a period of time. And for leapfrogging, for doing well in your career, for making sure that you are known for what you've mastered your craft at, you need to overcome boredom. You need to make sure that you develop your mental maps around it. And most importantly, that you're able to sustain that interest for a period of time, for an extended period of time, Lalita. And, and the reality of all of this is that it's not easy, right? It's easier to talk about it. It's easier to give gyan on it and write a book on it. But when it comes down to it, it does need those hours, right? Uh, various literature is available saying you need to practice something for 10,000 hours or, or more for it to become, you know, become a master at it. Um, don't be overwhelmed with it, but make a big name. Right? You need to identify your passion and, and you need to persevere, persevere with it and you need to sustain it for a period of time. Once you've got these string rights, then you know everything else will fall in place. Okay. So I'm going to um, jump at the question that Nilesh Ranpura has asked about uh, whether the chapters are applicable or valid for children. Um, absolutely, yes. In fact, the opening story is about the spelling bee contestants who are young, 13, 14, 15-year-old kids who are practicing for years together to win the spelling bee. Uh, we have the example of the young Mozart, who as an eight or nine or 10 year old child was supposed to be a prodigy. And we argue that it was not really being a prodigy. He had that environment where he grew up and he could do so well because of uh, the environment he was in. Uh, we've used the example of Michael Phelps, the swimmer, who has a, won the maximum number of medals in one Olympics, how he swam blind because his glasses, his goggles uh, had a leak. But his coach had trained him to swim based on the number of, of strokes he would do, the feel of the water against the body. So he turned around at the end without even seeing the, the, the end of the swimming pool. And he created a world record. So it's a number of stories of young people um, in the book that um, Nilesh that you will enjoy. Nilesh, it's a great question that you ask, actually. And in fact, uh, one other story is the one that we just shared with you, which is on President Trump and Modi. That's also a 12-year-old who did this. Um, I have a 10-year-old at home and I and I read out stories to him and he loves them and, and, and you know, he's able to relate to them. So I think, I think um, don't overwhelm them with the full book, but I think these stories are, are very relevant to them and they'll be able to do something, learn something from them. So I hope your children, your kids enjoy it. There's a very interesting question, uh, which is basically, <clears throat> so the question is from Lalita, uh, who asks, is, is there any limitation for leapfrogging? I think the limitation is, the, is, the, is what you create in your mind. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. I mean, this is a personal example. Um, I, uh, at the ripe old age <laughs> or the young age of 42, did a PhD. So I decided in my mid thirties that I needed to change my career. Now, conventional logic is that you do your PhD straight after your master's and you start working as an academic in your mid twenties or late twenties. Well, I started my academic life at 42 and that too in the US. I done a fresh PhD, as you mentioned, Aditya from IM Bangalore. And I took a risk of, of trying to leapfrog, went to interviews, I got a job at a teaching school, uh, later did research and got into a research school. And then fortunately, I am Ahmedabad was good enough to take me on as faculty. So I don't think these limitations actually exist in the real world. The limitations we all, I believe, impose on ourselves. Um, Priyank, do you agree? You did a PhD late too. Yes. No, absolutely. I think it's the, the limitation is, is the mindset. Uh, so as long as you are, you see every step that you achieve as a celebration, a small win, and you are ready for that big win, you're going to keep going. Um, so Lalita, keep, keep, keep celebrating every small win. Keep celebrating every little success that you enjoy and, and uh, make sure that you keep that persistence. You know, at the end of the day, it does require hard work. So you can be inspired by this book. You can be inspired by many other books. You can be inspired by motivational speakers. Um, you can have a mentor. You can have a good boss. You can have a great organization, great job, great startup. It does mean that you need to get your hands dirty and work hard. 
and that is not uh, easy and it's not easy to sustain over a period of time work hard work smart and um, i think there is no end to what leapfrogging can can do to you all right so let's ask the next question uh, is anonymous but here's a question uh, individuals are known to pro, uh, possess the overconfidence bias which is in fact contrary to intellectual humility uh, that you guys have mentioned uh, <clears throat> could you enlighten on how one can realize where to apply what and find a balance Priyank, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, Mukesh, why don't you explain the story of the Dunning Kruger effect? I'll I'll put up the the graph for you. Okay, so that's an interesting story. That um, there's this guy who hears that if you apply lemon juice on your face, you'll become invisible, because he's heard the story in his childhood that to write an invisible letter, put lemon juice inside your pen. So he then takes lemon juice and applies it to his face, and he takes a picture of himself, and the picture is blank. now it could be that the camera was faulty it could be that there was no film in the camera whatever but he ultimately convinced himself that he would be invisible to cameras and he walks into a bank uh, he then proceeds to steal money in the bank and even waves to the camera with a big smile and uh, within an hour the cops land up at his house and arrest him and uh, his reaction is but i applied the juice the logic being that lemon juice makes you invisible so this uh, a professor read this article in 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 the daily newspaper and then started wondering is it possible that we are too stupid to really know how stupid we are and that's how the dunning kruger effect came about and to get people to to realize that they don't they're not as smart they don't know as much as they think he got them to do the toilet test where he said explain to me how a toilet works most people think a toilet is a very simple thing to understand but when they start understanding the dynamics of how a toilet actually works they 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 get to the bottom of the graph or the curve that priyank has just pulled up where you start off by being overconfident i know everything about this field intellectual humility is that sweet spot where you start delving into the field you realize that it's more complicated than you thought you in fact then get overawed by the field saying i'll never understand this this is just beyond my comprehension but as you keep engaging with it it starts to make sense and that's when you realize that the field is complicated but you are getting a grip on it uh, priyank yours priyank are you muted No, I, I think, think you uh, lost Priyank. We have lost uh, Priyank. Yeah. Varuna, can you stop sharing Priyank's screen? Uh, can you do that, or he has to do it? Just give me a second. I'll try to do that. Okay. So till that time, since we are on the on the question of uh, intellectual humility, Mukesh, let me ask you this question. Okay. So there's a push a uh, question from Sushil uh, Thakur. Dear professor, how do you see intellectual humility play out in startups with visible proverbial uh, tech messiah Steve Jobs, Elon Musk? Does the larger world see intellectual arrogance, perhaps in the pu uh, pursuit of one's conviction, as being more relevant in new age enterprises? Okay, so Sushil has been a, one of my favorite students from our EPGB program, and uh, Aditya, you probably taught him too. And Sushil is a very good question. but i would argue that the steve jobs and the elon musks of the world are in a very small minority they are visionary leaders and they come about once in a few generations so if you're going to be a regular entrepreneur like most of us were and will be or like i was i don't think you should have the arrogance to say this is what the world needs and i shall produce it and i shall create a demand because people don't realize that they really need it i would put it in the reverse order i would follow the lean startup model which again uh, sushil is aware of it t-shirt at the iims where you start with a with the basic feature that you think the customer needs you take it to the customer get feedback incorporate more features and then offer the product so i would say the examples that you have quoted sushil are very far apart and very rare 
I want to just add one quick word here, Mukesh, that um, again, examples that you've taken are great for the world. A part of their image um, for the outside world is to have that image of arrogance and overconfidence. But if you really ask them where they learn and where they're sort of getting better at their craft, it it has to come with a lot of humility. Because without that, because without your ability to go into the depth of what they really are good at, you will not be able to do that without humility. Um, I would add there that everybody knows that Steve Jobs was ousted, ousted from his original company. Yeah. And um, he was very publicly shamed. And he says it was the best thing that could happen to him ever. Because when he came back later through the Pixar route, he was much more successful. So I think that partly these guys are visionaries, partly they do have the intellectual humility to recognize, uh, for example, Steve Jobs, the kind of people he hired. Now he recognized the supply chain was a key part of the Apple, um, Apple success. And he got people on board who were good at that because he knew he, he, he was while he could recognize technology and work around it. He didn't have the other aspects to it. Um, so let me ask you this. I, I like this question. Uh, so I'm going to ask you this and maybe with a slight twist. So the question is, uh, how can this book help someone if he or she isn't sure about his career choice? Let me add a little bit more. There are a lot of people who will feel that I'm stuck. Yeah. Right. I'm stuck. And it's a quicksand around me. And the more I struggle, the deeper I go rather than jumping out. Can you tell them how your book can help them? Yeah. So those I would stuck and those who are not sure, both. So I would first urge you to, to chill out, relax. We've got an entire section, four or five pages, on late bloomers, people who succeeded when they were in their 50s and 60s and 70s. So if you feel you are stuck, A, don't panic. It's not the end of the world. Number one. Number two, engage with people who are different from you. People who come from a different background, who have different conversations, and you can access them through your network. And our networks play a very prominent role. And we've talked a lot about networks in the book, that uh, your second, third, fourth degree of network can influence you. So look beyond the people you are engaged with and see what the conversations amongst them are. And maybe they could be a source of, 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 of something new for you. Uh, Priyank. No, I think uh, the social groups are one of the most important elements uh, when you feel stuck. Uh, and that's why, you know, there's so much of importance given to networking. But, uh, and, and Mukesh has already talked about that. I would urge them to actually look at the tool that we have provided, which is the personal journey map. You see, the personal journey map is a very, very simple tool to use, which says list any one thing that you want to achieve and then create a roadmap around how you can achieve that right and it, it there it, it's it's if i may say idiot proofed because it has very simple questions to answer each box and when you introspecting in filling up that personal journey map you will get a lot of ideas that you may eventually um, you know use and and find people who may help you get in, engaged into uh, groups there is a very interesting concept called intersection hunting, right? When you are stuck, you actually deliberately put yourself into an intersection of disciplines that can probably give you ideas. So how do you create an opportunity for yourself to be in that intersection of multidisciplinary ideas, of curated you know, views, etc.? So I think these are some of the ideas that you can implement um, and, and, and use. Um, we also have a website, uh, Aditya, which lists down the personal journey map. So uh, I can type it out. It's called leapfrog.work, uh, which will uh, help uh, you know people uh, access the personal journey map as well. Yeah, so I'll just take a second, a minute here. Um, uh, uh, Bharatwaj Ravi has asked a good question and has already given the answer within the question. He's, he's talking of a mindset, a growth mindset. And the growth mindset is not about bothering, bothering about the results, but about bothering about the process that you follow. So it's not that I'm good at something or I'm preordained to be great at it. 
But if I follow a certain process and I keep looking at the process carefully and improving, I will finally get to the objective that I want to get to. So if you're stuck in quicksand and you are, you are keen to do something different or something else, don't worry about the results initially. Follow that passion, persevere with it and celebrate small wins. All right. I think uh, there are lots of questions and we are short on time. <laughs> uh, so uh, Mukesh, why don't you pick any one question that you would like to answer? And maybe Priyank, you can pick one question that you would like to answer. Yeah. Uh, Priyank, you go ahead. I, I, I'm just scrolling through. I wasn't looking at them. Uh, maybe an everyday exercise that everyone can do. Um, yeah. Like to talk about that, Priyank? Yeah, I think um, one of the things, and since we are, you know, uh, talking about behavioral science and behavioral economics here, uh, it is how you actually create your workspace, right? Uh, you have to create a nudge that will push you to do something that you've been wanting to do. And I'll give a few quick examples of this, right? So I had a student who was struggling to learn to play the guitar. Instead of putting his guitar away, tucked away in the cupboard, he said, I'll put my guitar next to my table where I'm sitting. And every time I'm taking a break, I'm going to, um, you know, play the guitar, even if it's for five minutes. And in the process, you know, in a, in a day, he was able to play the guitar for close to an hour. So he nudged himself by placement of something that he wanted to do. Another student who was struggling with a weight issue, he was obese. Um, and he wanted to lose weight and he was struggling to lose weight. He actually worked on social groups. He found a friend who was a stickler for diet. And he went to have lunch with that person every day. And that person would only have fruit, salad, smoothie. And in the process, he said, I just stopped gorging on food. Because I said, you know, that the, the company, the environment around actually helps you choose, uh, you, you know, the choices that you make. So he created a nudge there uh, for himself. And, and of course, the last example here uh, is, you know, keeping a tracker for uh, working out, exercising, having a little calendar where you were doing a little red or green checkbox that you achieved it and then making sure that you are nudging yourself to keep that pattern going. So something that's going to get you going, something that's going to help you with the behavioral uh, neurosciences uh, principles involved is creating nudges around you. And I really hope, Paditya, that with all the good work that your center is doing, um, many of our uh, listeners and audiences are able to nudge themselves uh, using these principles of behavioral economics and behavioral science. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mukesh, any last words before? No, I think uh, Lalita, uh, who's been a, a continuous questioner and asking good questions, uh, if you can think of another practice, we'll be very happy to talk to you about it and uh, investigate it. But uh, we try to limit it to six. And within the six practices, there are three pillars. There are 18 of them, which we didn't want to keep expanding. All right. Uh, Thank you very much, Mukesh. Thank you very much, Priyank, for being a part and sharing your uh, expertise with us and our listeners. Uh, also, a big thank you to all the people who joined in for this webinar. Uh, and we hope that we you went back with a lot of knowledge, uh, especially from Mukesh and Priyank on how to leapfrog your career. Thank you again very much and a good night to all of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Aditya. Thank you very, very much. Oh, Aditya has signed out. I think it went well, Priyank. You are still, We are still live, Mukesh. Okay, I'll, 